Well, welcome back to Sunday uh, Connect and Grow Hour. I'm Todd Mitchell. Glad you're here. Uh, today we're going to be looking at how Jesus Christ builds his church. Now, if you've been around the church for a while, um, been around Jesus and scripture for a while, then you know that we are the church. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple, right? The church is its people. Um, but we're going to talk today, we're going to talk about how God uses the corporate church or the, the main body of church, uh, of the church, how uh, God builds that church, why he builds it, and then what we do within the church. That's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So the church is built up um, by how the Holy Spirit uses believers to encourage other believers and how the Holy Spirit guides all of us to reach people outside of the church for Jesus Christ. In the church, in the church body as we know it, um, mature believers encourage each other, um, we help each other, we um, build each other up, we care for each other, um, we help each other become um, more uh, involved in who Jesus is, uh, understanding who Jesus is, um, those types of things. But then we encourage new believers. We go out and we teach new believers. We reach new believers uh, beyond the church walls. And we tell others about the good of Jesus Christ. Now, this is just not the pastor. This is just not choice uh, Sunday school teachers. This is not just the evangelism crew. This is all of our responsibility. We all need to reach other others for Jesus Christ. We encourage each other within the church and then we go outside of the walls of the church and we, um, we tell others about who Jesus uh, Christ is. Um, so we ha within the church, we, we help each other grow and follow Jesus so that we become more like Jesus every day. We do that through our generosity, through helping each other's uh, needs. We mentor each other. We hold each other accountable. We help each other. And then when the church lives together in these ways, it can provide a powerful witness to an unbelieving world. Now, the opposite of that is if you have a church that's full of infighting and a church that is uh, deeply divided, then that is also a witness to the world, a poor witness. So we need to be careful what we're doing in the church. Now, we're a family and we have disagreements within a family. That's part of the good thing about being in a family. You can have disagreements. But at the end of the day, after we have our disagreements, we should be able to support and love and care for each other like a family would do. And that should be the witness to the world that, hey, look at, they may argue over there, but they do care for each other and they care for each other because of what Jesus Christ did to them, for them. So in this session, we'll consider how those of us who belong to the church should encourage each other in our faith within the church as well as spreading the news of Jesus Christ um, outside of the church the, so that everyone who uh, wants to know or needs to know can come into the full saving power of Jesus Christ. So this week we're going to look at Acts chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 19, and then we're going to read that pretty much through the end of the, the, the chapter there. So if you want to get your Bibles out and turn to Acts Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 19, and then we, you could follow along and highlight and make notes in your Bible as you see fit. But first, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for coming to earth and forgiving us of our sins. We thank you for providing for our every need and a lot of our wants. We thank you for putting uh, other believers in our life that we can encourage. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to encourage each other uh, and to reach the world for your purpose. Uh, we give you this lesson in your beautiful name. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 11, starting in verse 19. Now, if you are um, looking at most Bibles, most Bibles will have a title here. Um, it might be titled The Church at Antioch, or it might be The Church of Antioch, or The Church in Antioch. Regardless, we're talking about um, the church um, uh, in Antioch, and I'll show you where Antioch is in a second on a map. 
Uh, but regardless of where, what your heading says in the Bible, it's an account of what believers did in spreading the word of Jesus Christ to fellow Jews and to Gentiles in what is now uh, northern Syria. Now, I believe there's two main reasons for this passage. Uh, in, in chapter 11, starting verse 19, there's two main reasons. One is to sp tell others about the great news of Jesus Christ. And then uh, part two is then we need to help and um, how we reach others. Um, I'm sorry. The first one is to tell others the great news of Jesus Christ. And then number two is how we encourage each other in Jesus and how we treat each other um, as fellow believers. All right, so the city of Antioch at the time was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Now, this is going to be very important in a, in a little bit when I explain. I'll explain why in a little bit. So keep that in mind. The city of Antioch, where um, this is taking place, is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It is the largest city in the Roman Empire in Syria. So um, in Syria, the country of Syria, this is the largest Roman Empire city, um, third largest in the Roman Empire. So that's really important because that means all sorts of people are there. We see Jews, we see Greeks, we see Gentiles, we see all sorts of people from all over the Roman Empire coming to this hub um, uh, to trade commerce and ideas and ideologies and that types of things. So um, the fact that, that Christianity has reached this point um, means it's going to start to really ex uh, accelerate throughout the uh, Roman Empire. And that's really important because that's what we want to do, right, is we want to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Okay, so that means all sorts of people are gathering here uh, and... Uh, people are going to start to see Jesus more clearly throughout the world. So let's take a look at where Antioch is on the map. All right, so this is the Mediterranean Sea. This is Cyprus. This is the country of Turkey, modern-day Turkey. Here's Greece. Italy is over here. Uh, Jerusalem is way down here. This is, uh, this is Egypt here. So this is uh, Africa, the top of the African continent here. So Jerusalem. And then Antioch is right here. It's not there anymore. It's, there's ruins there. There's other cities around it. But this is where Antioch would be. Now, if you can notice this little inlet here into Turkey, that would have been a nice um, harbor, safe harbor from any of the... the um, uh, storms that would have raged in, in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, this is the island of Cyprus, and I'll talk about uh, Cyprus in a little bit and who came from there. It's going to be uh, pretty relevant in a minute. Okay, so let's take a look at the scriptures this morning, uh, starting Acts 11, starting at verse 19. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began also to speak to Greeks, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. All right, back to me. All right, so the beginning of this, this section we're looking at, in verse 19, the very beginning of this, it, it talks about when the, the, the Christians were scattered after the persecution that took place after uh, Stephen's death. So Stephen, um, this is... a this takes place in Acts chapter 7. So if you want to flip back there real quick, Acts chapter 7, uh, verse 54 through 60. This is where Stephen was stoned um, for, for believing in Jesus. He was stoned and he gave quite an eloquent speech about uh, how we should believe in Jesus Christ because of all the prophecy of the Old Testament foretells that Jesus is the Christ and then the heavens open up and uh, Stephen sees Jesus just before he's stoned to death. Also Saul, that we learn later, Paul, um, is there. So it's 
when it says that the Jews were scattered after the persecution that broke out um, in Jerusalem. This is after after Stephen was stoned. So after Stephen was Stephen was stoned, persecution in Jerusalem got even more fierce, not only from Jews, but from the Romans. Um, and so all the Christians that were living in Jerusalem were scattered. And the church needed to scatter so it could spread. It wouldn't have done the good news of Jesus Christ any good if it just stayed put, right? So God uh, created some of these uh, these persecutions so the Jews would get out of their comfort zone and go up into other places. And so uh, several of them went up the coast up to um, where we see Cyrene and we see uh, Cyprus and we see um, where Antioch is and they go up into these communities. Um, now, many of these Christian Jews, or many of these Christians, they would have been Jewish. They were uh, not necessarily Jewish converts. They were what we would call completed Jews, right? Completed Jews is a Jew that follows all of their Messianic uh, history, all of their Jewish heritage. They still followed a lot of their same Jewish laws and their Jewish customs. They were very Jewish. But now they were completed because they recognized that the Messiah, Jesus, had come. So when they scattered to the north, it would have been very natural for them to want to uh, go to communities that would have been uh, welcoming, that would have been familiar, that would have been comforting. So I think it was um, quite normal for them to go into the Jewish communities and settle there and to go into the Jewish activities and the Jewish synagogues and participate in the Jewish customs. But they did tell other Jews there about who Jesus was. And so there was getting some, um, they were getting some people to, that believed in Jesus, some more completed Jews, if you will. They recognized that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, so then they were um, being successful there. However, they just kept it within themselves. They just kept it with, some, uh, with the other Jews. So when they entered these cities, um, it was natural for them to want to stay together, and, um, but they still, they still preached the good news to each other. Um, about who Jesus Christ w was. Now, um, uh, I'm kind of lost myself in my notes as usual. Let me see if I can. F okay, so, um, so two things I think we can get out of verse 19 is that that we we must share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that we're comfortable with, right? The, these. These Christians, they left their Jewish homes in Jerusalem. They went up into these other cities and went to this Jewish sit um, areas. And they were very comfortable there. And so we too, it's good to share and encourage each other in our comfort zone, right? I have my comfort zone, the people that I'm comfortable with. And it's good to encourage each other in those um, comfort zones, to remind uh, your friends and your relatives and, and so forth um, who Jesus Christ is. And we can go to them when we're feeling down. That's really important, right? And we do that in the church. It's really important in the church, in the church body when we meet together, that we can encourage each other. We tell each other about Jesus, like I'm telling you about Jesus right now. But there's another part of what we see in this section here is, is we need to go beyond our comfort zone. And so some men did go beyond, said right in the passage, some men, uh, probably their uh, significant others, their wives probably went with them too. Um, but it specifically says some men went, went and told um, others, uh, it says, spread the, the news of Jesus Christ to non-Jews, the Gentiles in the area. And that is where they started to see an explosion of growth, right? So yeah, they had uh, some, um, probably had some success just amongst themselves, but they probably weren't going to grow. They were just talking, the Jew Jewish um, community was not going to grow. They might have 
believed in Jesus Christ, but it wasn't going to expand. And in our church, we're not going to expand if we're just talking to each other about Jesus. If our goal is to reach the world for Jesus Christ, if our goal is to reach the lost for Jesus Christ, it's not going to do anybody else any good if we're just going to sit around talking about Jesus uh, in our church. It is going to do each other good because we need to be encouraged that way, but we really have to go outside and we have to tell others, just like as these, these guys did, they went to Cyprus and Antioch and started to tell other people about Jesus. So I believe it says a lot for us as a church. We love our church. We love our, our certain groups that we gravitate to. Nothing wrong with that. I have my group of people that I like to hang out with. We build each other up. We encourage each other. We pray for each other. We make food for each other. But we cannot forget to spread the good news of Jesus Christ beyond these groups, beyond the church. Yes, it's super comfortable to talk about Jesus with our fellow believers. But we have to move on beyond that. And I think many of us, when we read this, we're very comfortable talking about uh, who the Messiah is. And these people were very comfortable about talking about who the Messiah is to fellow Jews. But as we read further in the text, they had to go beyond them, beyond that, uh, and tell others about Jesus. And it says in verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So if you want your church to grow and thrive, you need to speak to others outside the walls of your church about Jesus. And don't worry, the Lord's hand will be with you just like the Lord's hand was with them through this process. If you don't know what to say, just tell them your testimony. Tell them what Jesus means to you. That, and then the Lord will be with you, and then the num your number, their number, could increase. Okay. And as the new Christians shared Jesus with other people of Antioch, then many other people believed. And it says in verse 22, the news then reached Jerusalem. Okay, so they're, they're sharing the good news to, to each other. They're sharing the good news to uh, the Gentiles, the other people in Antioch, and um, news spread. And the news got back to Jerusalem. So we're going to move now to, doo -doo. oh, I lost it. Let me pull up my slide here. That's not where I want to be. Oh my gosh, I'm all over the place. So I guess I'll just read it to you then. Sorry. Uh, so I'm in uh, Acts 11, starting in verse 22. So the news of this, what the news was that the church was growing in Antioch, the news reached the church in Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is where Peter and Barnabas were in Jerusalem. Um, there were other apostles in Jerusalem that were working and building the church in Jerusalem. That was probably the, the, the head of uh, Christianity at the time. So the news, this news reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, Barnabas arrived, he saw that the grace of God, what the grace of God has done. He was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. The believers in Antioch grew. So much so that the leaders, likely Paul and the other apostles, like I mentioned, in Jerusalem, made the decision to send Barnabas. So why did they send Barnabas, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked why they sent Barnabas. They sent Barnabas likely for several reasons. First reason is Barnabas was familiar with the area. He spoke Greek. The primary language of Antioch was Greek. Barnabas was also a Levite, which means he was in the priestly line of the Jews. He would have had a lot of knowledge of the scripture, so he would have been able to use scripture, um, the, the Hebrew Bible, and tell them how Jesus met the requirements for being the Messiah. And uh, 
he was an encourager. Uh, so we can read about uh, Barnabas. Our Barnabas uh, is first mentioned in Acts 4. I think this is where I meant to pull up my last slide is, I don't know why my slides are not working. Here they are. Acts 4. Uh, 36 through 37. Joseph, I thought you said you're talking about Barnabas. Hold on. Verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which mean, means son of encouragement. Um, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so uh, his name was Joseph. He was from Cyprus. And remember, I showed you Cyprus. This is where Barnabas is from. Okay, here's Jerusalem. So somehow Barnabas got down here. Joseph, his name's Joseph, gets down here. They rename him. We don't know the story about why and how he was renamed, but he was renamed Barnabas. He had some land in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he owned some land. He sold it, and then he brought that money to the apostles, and then they used it. So I think uh, the reason why they chose Barnabas were many reasons. He was from Cyprus. A lot of these, uh, this, the persecuted church ended up there um, and Antioch. Um, he was an encourager. He showed that he had great faith. He was obedient because he sold the land and gave it back to the church. Um, so there's lots of reasons why they sent Barnabas up there. But he sounds like he was the perfect guy to build the church. Then on to verse 23. And then when Barnabas arrived, he saw that the grace of God uh, was very prevalent. He saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and he encouraged them all to re remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So I think it's interesting. Um, uh, Luke is the one who wrote this. He makes a point of saying that Barnabas is a good man. Um, and if you remember Barnabas, the story of Barnabas and, uh, and maybe Paul, they do get into disagreement at one point. So Luke is making a point of saying, even though that Paul and Barnabas may have gotten in an argument, he's still a good man. He's still full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And because he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, a great number of people were brought to the Lord because he was an encourager, because he told them to remain uh, true to the Lord with all their hearts, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. These are uh, what caused a great number of people to come to the Lord. Oh, my slides just goofed up on me again. So why were a great number of people brought to the Lord? Well, the scripture says that he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. So why are people coming to the Lord? There, these are three main, four main things. He told them to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. So a part of that is not thinking about other things. He was a good man, so he was a good example. He was full of the Holy Spirit, so he wasn't just relying on doing this himself. He had the Holy Spirit uh, working in him and that, that he had faith. So I wonder what Barnabas would say to us. If he would come to our church and say, well, how would he encourage us? It's great to have an encourager, but what what would he do? And I believe he would tell us that. I think he would tell us to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Don't worry about this other stuff. Don't worry about COVID. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about who's president. Don't worry about who's governor. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Remain true to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Right? I believe Barnabas would have held on to that and told people about that. He would tell, tell us to stay focused on the Lord Jesus Christ in all that we do, in all that we do. So everything that you're doing throughout your day, stay focused on Jesus. He was a good man. So his example of what, how he presented himself, he was a man of integrity. His yes was yes. His no was no. He wasn't off doing goofy things. We don't read about Paul, uh, Barnabas over in uh, hanging out with prostitutes. Uh, 
maybe he did to teach them about Jesus, but he didn't go over there to uh, solicit prostitutes. He wasn't looking at porn. He wasn't gossiping. He wasn't doing these things. He was a good man and he was full of the Holy Spirit. So as that example, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Paul because Paul is like Jesus. I want to be like Barnabas because he's like Paul, like, right? So he's a good example and he's full of the Holy Spirit. So if we learn from that example, we can be good men and women full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And those things will help the church grow. But as much as an encourager as Barnabas was, and as much of a good man as Barnabas was, and had the help of the Holy Spirit and was full of faith, he was a little bit over his head. So if we move up to um, Acts 11.25, Acts 11.25 is, nope, that's not it. That's not it either. Where to go? I think I've lost Acts 25 as well. All right, so you'll have to listen to me read again. So Acts 11.25, when Barnabas went to Tarsus, so then Barnabas went to Tarsus, so he went up to Antioch, he was pretty excited all that was going on, he's encouraging people, he's um, being a good example, he's teaching them about Jesus, um, and lots of people are coming to Jesus, but he's a little over his head. So he goes to look for Saul. Now in this passage it mentions Saul. Now Saul and Paul are the same person. Um, so Saul is the Hebrew name and Paul would have been the Greek name. So um, just like Barnabas has two names, Joseph and Barnabas. So Barnabas then went to Tarsus, which is in Turkey, a little bit further up than where they were. So he went to Tarsus to look for Saul, Paul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Barnabas needed help. We need help. Yes, we can be good people. Yes, we can be the best Bible study uh, teacher in the world, which I don't claim to be, but um, I need help. Pastors need help. Uh, those of us in the church need help. And what we should do is we should reach out to other people that can help us. Barnabas did the same thing. He needed help, so he sought out Paul, Saul, same guy. So Barnabas goes up to Tarsus, <coughs> excuse me, goes up to Tarsus, gets Paul, and I'm sure that Barnabas and Paul had a conversation. Hey, Paul, you should see the amazing stuff that's going on in Antioch. There's all this great stuff going on there. I need some help. And maybe Paul gave Barnabas some advice and said, oh, you could do this. You could do this. You could do this. But maybe Barnabas pressed him and said, Paul, can you come down and help me? It would be awesome if you came down and helped me. So Paul comes down to uh, Antioch from uh, Tarsus, which is a little higher up, like I said, in, in Turkey there. Comes down to Antioch, and they both stay in Antioch for one year. And they're teaching in Antioch for a year. Uh, they're teaching other um, Jews how to be more Christ-like. They're teaching Gentiles to be uh, Christ followers. Um, they're doing all of this so much so that they started to become Christians. As always, when I want to know the entomology of a word, more than the root of a word, um, in, especially in Hebrew or in Greek, I will turn to my favorite theologian, who happens to be Sean Mitchell, my son. And I said to him, hey, what is um, the meaning of this word, uh, the root word here in Greek? I could look it up, but it's always fun to talk to my son, uh, who says hi, by the way. Um, so he says, well, uh, literally, the translation is follow, follower of the anointed one. It is Greek, Christian, the word Christ, Christ uh, or Christianos is Greek. They were in Antioch, very influenced by the Greeks. It uh, comes from the Greek word Christos, meaning the anointed one. So a, a Christian would be a uh, uh, follower follower of the anointed one or follower of Christ. 
Now, the adjective, verb, whatever, ending borrowed from Latin to note to denote adhering to or even belonging to as in slave ownership. Now, I think that's really in interesting, this, this idea that um, a follower of Christ, a Christian, is a follower of the anointed one, but following so much so that it is almost like a slave. Now, we don't like being called slaves, but I think that's going to be uh, interesting here. Uh, we belong to Jesus Christ. Now, these people in Antioch were following Jesus Christ so much that they almost wouldn't do anything without Jesus' permission. They were obligated, they felt obligated to follow Jesus. Just like a slave would be obligated to follow his master, a slave wouldn't do anything without a master's permission. A slave does things because the the slave owner tells them to. Now, we're not slaves, we're not chained up in slaves, but the point here is our lives should be so ordered that the things that we do, we should consult Jesus. Which is, Jesus, should I spend my money here? Jesus, should I watch this TV show? Should I read this? Should I do the... We should be so in tune with Jesus that we know what what would be required. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because we know some of this other stuff is not good for us. So Christ followers following the anointed one, so much so that we can't really do anything without wanting to ask for permission. We want to order our lives in a way that would be pleasing to Jesus because ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to become more like Christ. They were first called Christians there in Antioch because people realized that they were different. Not that they were just walking around mindless like, oh, I have to ask Jesus what to do. But something about them was different. Something about them is they're not going to these uh, the shrine prostitutes. They weren't, you know, getting over. They weren't getting drunk. They weren't doing things that they shouldn't be doing. But what, else, what about them? What else was being different? There must have been something. So people that are with Jesus, they're different. And that's why people started to, to call them Christians. Do people realize that I'm different? And I, I wondered when people look at me, do, are they like, that's something different about that guy. He, he seems different. Like maybe he, I, don't, I can't put my finger on it. Maybe you know somebody like that, or maybe you are that somebody that when you when people come up to you, they're like they're different because they're around you. They want to be different people because they are they're around you, right? I, there's a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. I'm like a better person when I'm around him. And why am I a better person when I'm around him? Because he he's with Jesus all the time. And that's what I want to be like. I want to be not like my friend. I'm, he's cool and all, but I want to be like Jesus. That's that's the different thing. So these Christians are different. They're changed people. They are people that other people want to hang out with. They're noticeably different in a good way. Not just because they're telling people, oh, you shouldn't drink that, or no, you shouldn't do that. That's No, they're just going about their lives, and they're ordering their lives after the pattern of Jesus. And that's what we should be like, too. We should just pattern our life as Jesus would want, and let other people observe that, and notice that we have peace, that we have joy, despite all this other stuff going on. How are you so peaceful in the midst of COVID? Oh, I know Jesus. What? How is that? How? And then that gets you in a conversation, which then brings them into um, the church, hopefully, right? Are there Christians around you that um, because you, they're around you, you act different? Because of how they know Jesus, you want to be a better person. I hope that's you. I hope that there's somebody in your life that that you can uh, use that person as a mentor to help you to come into a better relationship with Jesus. 
So now, where do we go from here? Now, what do we do with all this? I've lost my place again. So how do we get to this point? We get to this point because we follow Jesus closely. We get to this point because we want to be, we're following Jesus so close that we want to be mistaken for him. We want to follow Jesus so much that I don't do anything without uh, first consulting Jesus. Not some of the time, not just on Sunday, all the time. All right, so we're going to move on to verse 27. So maybe I do have, yep, there I do have verse 27. So during this time, the time that Barnabas and Saul are in Antioch, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, one of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each one was as each one was able, decided to provide help for brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did by sending their, their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. All right, so what's going on here? So while Saul and Barnabas are still teaching and still living in Antioch for that year, they were teaching, they're creating disciples, they're building up the church. Now, some prophets came, it says, comes down from uh, Jerusalem, actually Jerusalem's to the south, so technically they would be moving up. What they mean by come down, like coming down the chain of command, coming down the chain of command from Jerusalem, the center of Christianity, to Antioch to deliver this word to them. Now, it's interesting in this section that a group of prophets were together. And that's how prophets should uh, operate. They should be in community. They should be uh, in communication with other prophets so that they can make sure what they are saying is without error. Because if a prophet is uh, out on their own doing their own thing, uh, they could get into error and saying some pretty goofy things. Okay, so if you have a prophet mentality, get with another prophet uh, so that you can bounce uh, your, your prophecies off of each other so that you make sure that they're accurate. So anyway, a group of prophets is coming from Jerusalem to Antioch because they had a word for the people in Antioch. And the word was a famine was about ready to hit um, the Roman Empire. So remember when I said that Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire? This is important. Because it's the third largest city in the Roman Empire, the news that a famine was coming would have spread throughout the Roman Empire a little quicker. And what did the, the Christians, what were they doing about it? And what were the Christians doing about it? They were getting ready. They took the word of the Lord from the prophet Agabus very seriously and they prepared. They uh, provided for each other. They made sure each other's needs were met. They made sure that they put stuff away so that they would be able to endure the famine to come. And they were able to uh, take some, uh, some resources and they, they sent that gift to Judea because of the great famine that was to come uh, in the name of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, so the third, it's amazing how God orchestrates all of this, right? So he needed the word of the Lord to get out. So he uses the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And he wants people to be aware that a famine is coming. Now, a lot of people who didn't know the Lord probably just like, whatever, dudes. But these people who were finally in tune with the word, who heard and listened to Agabus and the other prophets were able to prepare. And so then they were able to endure the famine. I believe that Acts 11 is a great example of how the church should work. We share the gospel to each other. We share the gospel. We encourage each other uh, inside of our church as we should do but then we move outside of the church and we we uh, share the gospel with each other the church equips 
old believers, uh, mature believers, we help the mature believers, but then we equip the new believers. The church strengthens current believers. It teaches, cares for, and uh, meets the needs of others in the church, but also moves beyond that. We have to move beyond our church. We can't just be this cloistered church. We can't just like, it's just us and oh, I'm just coming here to be fed and I'm not going to do anything with that once I leave. We are required as Christians to do something with that when we leave. These, these um, uh, Christians were scattered from Jeru Jerusalem, went up to Antioch and other places to share the good news of Jesus Christ. It, if, it, and if it is the good news of Jesus Christ, then we should want to share it. I pray that when you come to church, that you use that as an opportunity to encourage and build each other up that we equip in new believers. We share Jesus with those that are in the church and with those that are outside of the church. And when we do that, as it says in verse 21, the Lord's hand will be with him, with us. The Lord's hand will be with us and a great number of people will believe and will turn to the Lord. I, I believe that this is a great lesson for us today. I hope you uh, got something out of this, but let's pray and uh, then we can go from here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your example, the Church of Antioch. Help us to encourage each other within the church, but then to move outside of the church, knowing that your hand will be with us. Help us to be good men and women using the Holy Spirit in our great faith so that others can come to know who you are and um, see that we are different, not because of what we don't do, but 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 because of what we do do. We love you, Lord, and we want others to love you too. We thank you in your name. Amen. All right, guys, be good.